Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Lyceum uh, project for this evening. I'm uh, Ben Myers. I'm here representing Oklahoma Baptist University's Great Books Honors Program, which is uh, thrilled and delighted to be co-sponsoring this talk this evening. You know, um, Lee's work is uh, so much about building community that is committed to spiritual refreshment and renewal. And I think in so many ways that describes the relationship between our program and the academy. Uh, as I always say, um, so many of my best students come out of this school and most of my best students come in to teach here. Uh, and uh, in doing that, um, they bring to their communities, I think, that wisdom and virtue that they've uh, sought in our program and throughout their lives. So we are thrilled to be here this evening, and I can't wait to hear what our guest has to say. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Black, the Lyceum Director. Well, welcome all to the Academy's ninth annual Lyceum Project. We're gratified and encouraged by your presence this evening on a Friday night. Grateful to First Baptist Church for use of this space, to OBU's Honors College, Honors Program for its co-sponsorship, to Commonplace Books for its book table, to the Culture and Events team for all its efforts to make this weekend a success. As Dr. Meyer said, I'm Andrew Black, teacher at Midtown this campus and director of Lyceum at the Academy. I have the pleasure of explaining the night and introducing our speaker. The Lyceum Project seeks to involve the Academy and its larger community in the wide work of God's kingdom, to invite Christian artists and thinkers to help us consider what it means to live faithful lives in the world. The evening begins with a lecture, continues with some time for questions of and responses by the speaker, and concludes with an invitation to continue the conversation in Midtown and at home and in our lives. In the fourth century, a youthful Manichaean devotee and apologist from the small backwater town of Thagast returns home from his far-flung education and rhetoric to take up a teaching position. Encountering a former acquaintance, the two strike up and renew a friendship, and though the unnamed friend is being catechized as a Christian, our young Manichaean teacher makes easy work of dismantling his friend's fledgling faith. Quote, for I had turned him away from the true faith, to which, being only young, he had no strong or profound allegiance, the young apologist confesses, turned him towards those superstitions and mythologies which were the reason for my mother's tears over me. And yet, because of God's mercy, the young teacher, of course, it's the young Saint Augustine, he comes to realize God takes the man from this life when their friendship has scarcely completed a year, even though that friendship had been sweet to him beyond all the sweetness of life that he had experienced. The youthful Augustine, living in the midst of the delusions of his self-sufficient quest for wisdom, arguing for the wrong things, encounters in an undeniable way the limits of his creatureliness, the limits that we all face, our vulnerability, our embodiedness, our mortality. In facing the death of a friend, Augustine famously writes, I had become to myself a vast problem. And with the hindsight of faith, Augustine concludes that though his grief is not quite wrong, it also, and importantly, is not quite right. He writes, what madness not to understand how to love human beings with awareness of the human condition. Meaning, of course, its contingency, its frailty, its fleetingness. Our guest tonight embodies, perhaps as well as anyone I've encountered, the vigor of the long work of reasoned and reasoning faith, of a dialogue with God that grows from and grows more dialogue with others. 
Her quite public wrestling with faith, her quite public conversion to Catholicism, and her writing and speaking since that Palm Sunday in 2012 have resulted in a deeply coherent and striking body of work that especially recently reflects upon and puts forward the necessity of the varied consequences of human frailty, of human contingency, of the constant and underlying dialogue with God that such vulnerability exposes, the dialogue that St. Augustine puts forward long ago, the dialogue that underwrites, as Leah calls it, the common vocation of all humans, sainthood. Leah Labresco Sargent's writing often appears in Comment, Plow, and First Things. After graduating from Yale in 2011 and converting from atheism to Catholicism in 2012, Leah has worked as, among other things, a journalist, a freelance writer, the HR lead of a remittance company, and a curriculum developer for the Center for Applied Rationality. She currently works as a senior policy analyst at the Niskanen Center and runs a highly commendable substack called Other Feminisms. She is the author of two books, Arriving at Amen, about how she learned to pray, and Building the Benedict Option, an eminently practical guide to building thick Christian community. Please join me in welcoming Leah Labresco Sargent for tonight's Lyceum Project lecture, The Demands of Human Dependence. Thank you so much for having me. It is impossible to build a just society on the foundations of a lie. Whatever we build upon it will be unstable like the house built on sand, and sooner or later we have to reckon with the falsehoods we've woven into our conception of the world, our relationship to others, and to ourselves. Uh, there may be a couple pernicious lies threaded through our society, but I think one of the most deeply ingrained and deeply dangerous is the idea that what it means to be human is to be an autonomous individual. Oh, it becomes pretty obvious when just looking at the scope of a human life that if we take our image of what it means to be fully human, of being able to stand on your own, not dependent on anyone else, not having anyone depend on you in a way you can't easily sustain out of your own surplus, being able to remedy your own need impersonally in the marketplace when necessary, having a certain detachment from the world around you, a certain dispassionate neutrality. It becomes very obvious very quickly that if that's our image of what it means to be human, very, very few people are. Everyone begins their life in a state of utter and abject dependency, first in the womb, and then after crossing the contested and poorly defined viability line, whether in utero or by being birthed, a baby, upon being officially inaugurated into the world of legal persons, doesn't find him or herself to be that autonomous at all. You know, the, my baby, when hopefully delivered, uh, not tonight, but in about two months' time, don't worry, will be born, will be separated from me physically, but will hardly look around and go, I am now autonomous. You know, my baby is expected to be able to breathe on his own, uh, and if not, there will be people there to help, but certainly cannot feed himself, clothe himself, change himself, soothe himself, and only is viable after birth because there are other people there to succor him. You know, that question of when we become human, when we become viable enough, sort of depends on oh, how many people does it take to meet our need. If it's just one, that's, that's a little more suspicious, a little more intimately dependent than we're comfortable with. And if it's a team or some of them can be paid, well, maybe that's all right. Or sometimes we kind of gloss over the dependence at the beginning of life as embarrassing but excusable. You're on an upward trajectory. It's true we begin our lives radically dependent, but every day we get a little better. So a little more human. And those first few months or years or when you see the choices teenage boys make, you know, with their semi-developed frontal lobe, you know, 10, 15 years are sort of a rounding error in the scope of a human life, and the situation is constantly improving. So can we say that babies are people? Can we say that children are people? Well, maybe not technically by this definition of autonomy and independence we've put forward as our ideal, but we can say they're doing their best and they're getting closer and 
Thanks be to God, they'll grow out of it. Well, so much for the beginning of life. Of course, at the end of life, if we're lucky, if the end doesn't come suddenly by bus or other unfortunate physical accident, the end of life is also marked by a deep dependence on others. It may or may not involve diapers once again. It may or may not involve help to navigate and understand the world as we lose our sense of place and people. It can involve the same profound physical dependency that was at the beginning of life. And again, there's that temptation of, well, this doesn't, this doesn't quite fit what we've talked about as being human, but there were a number of good years, and this is just the last bit, and it doesn't count. Or increasingly, in some other countries, especially in Canada and several countries in Europe, there's a tendency to say, you know, that's right, this part of life, the end of life, isn't particularly human. It's not only not human, it's inhumane to ask a former human being to endure this way. And we see an increased enthusiasm for euthanasia, not just in the case of terminal illness, but in the case of any undignified way of living that isn't expected to be remediated anytime soon. An offer of sweet, seeming mercy, of saying, well, because you don't seem very human anymore, we know you wouldn't want to be seen like this, to live like this, so we'll do you the great favor of killing you. And then there won't be this prolonged semi-human part of your life. You can just stick to the good bits in the middle. I think it's obvious that it's hard to imagine you know, a moderate regime of euthanasia for the elderly, because the more that we look with disgust at dependence decline, the more it's obvious that those descents start earlier than we think, and it cuts more and more people out of the human family. And then, of course, when we turn our eyes to that middle that kind of justifies ignoring or forgiving the ends at either side, it's clear that for many people, life is not an unbroken stretch of individual autonomy for a good 30 or 40 years, that our lives are interrupted by periods of dependence, illness, disability, need, whether that comes in the form of a chronic lifelong challenge or just in periods of disruption, a prolonged illness, a sports injury, the interruptions of the people we love needing things from us. And then when we start to look at the human life, we see that it's almost no one who qualifies as human if we take as our standard individual autonomy and independence, that we begin our lives in dependence, we end our lives in dependence, and the entire middle is dappled with need and moments that connect us to others in our neediness. As though we look at a society that has asked everyone to live up to a standard that is itself unlivable. I often frame this critique when I'm starting a dialogue through the lens of feminism because this isn't a problem that affects only women, but if we look at the lie of autonomy, we can see that it's a lie that hurts women faster and more intimately to try and tell with our lives than it does men. And that's because although both men and women start their lives profoundly dependent, both men and women are marked by dependency throughout their lives, there's an asymmetry between the sexes where women are marked, sometimes very obviously and physically, by the potential for someone else's dependence to upend our lives. So no one can really keep up a reasonable front of being an independent human being for their whole lives. But for women, that moment of reckoning, of being unable to put up this false front will come sooner. And the cost of telling the lie will come more sharply. I think there's an interesting contrast of how we view women's openness or vulnerability to the dependence of others as either a core part of the human condition or a problem with women that has to be fixed for women to be equal. I'd look at this by contrasting the uh, views of former Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and bioethicist O. Carter Sneed. Is Ruth Bader Ginsburg never really favored Roe v. Wade on the merits of the argument. She favored the outcome, access to abortion. But she didn't think this was fundamentally a question of privacy or women deserving a certain amount of space from government intrusion. 
She thought it was a question of equal protection under the law. Then when a baby exists and makes a demand on its father, a man has the option to walk away. And all it asks of him is cowardice. But all he has to do is move further and further away to abandon someone who depends on him. And from Ginsburg's perspective, this represented a fundamental biological unfairness. For women to walk away from someone who depends on them so intimately can never be done simply by opening a door and leaving. It requires poison or a knife to make the separation total. And from Ginsburg's point of view, men and women could not be equal under the law if women as a class of people endured a set of demands based in dependence that men always had the opportunity to opt out of. Because men had the opportunity for vice, women needed a parallel opportunity to be equal. And I think you know, whether people frame it that way or not, that kind of fear that men and women can't be equal unless we are interchangeable with one another, that anything that marks us out as different fundamentally threatens women, is I think one of the primary things that leads us not to step in to defend dependence, but to think more about what options people have to escape the demands dependence makes on us. Rather than saying, how do we better form men or help them to step up to the demands that are real, that are placed on them, which they can more easily shrug off, we say, well, women need an escape route also. And I contrast her view with that of bioethicist O. Carter Sneed because he makes an argument in his book, What It Means to Be Human, that I've heard very rarely even from people who advocate against abortion. But I think often when people are making the case for the dignity of the baby, they make it out of the baby's capacity. You know, it's very much a, you should consider the baby is or might be human because at this stage, the baby's heart is beating. At this stage, the baby has fingernails. At this exact stage, my baby is apparently the size of uh, asparagus, which is not a very meaningful measurement to me, but suggests some level of extension in space that might lend the baby some dignity. And also, my baby is capable of you know, contracting or expanding his irises were there a little more to see by. As you know, people kind of face this temptation of making their case by stacking up capacity, going, look, the baby is almost like the mother. The baby has some of the capacities of the mother. We grant that the mother is human, so let's lend that dignity to the baby as well. And Sneed's one of the only people I've seen make the opposite argument. He says very straightforwardly, although baby has capacities and is human, regardless of its capacities, the baby is you know, brutally, nakedly, abjectly dependent on the mother. And because the baby asks so much of the mother, she resembles the baby because she is weakened by the demands the baby puts on her. And just as the baby, you know, asks things of her, the baby is titanic at sometimes demands force her to rely more on others during pregnancy. And it's interesting because the argument Snead is making is almost the same as the argument Ginsburg is making. They both kind of agree descriptively about what's happening. The baby's vulnerability makes the woman more vulnerable. It makes her less inviolate, less autonomous, less interchangeable with someone who doesn't carry this bodily responsibility. And they disagree about what that implies. Because of course, what Snead is doing in comparing a fully grown woman to a baby is usually something we view as a bit out of line. If I say, you are like this baby, technically what I'm doing is infantilizing you. And we view that as insulting because we think the baby is, in some sense, not good or not fully a person, such that for me to say, I resemble my baby, means I'm counting myself as worth less because we've already implicitly conceded the baby is worth less by virtue of its neediness. But for Snead, this is a matter of simple realism. If we can't admit that the baby has dignity in its need, we can't see the baby truly, and if we can't admit that the woman is genuinely made needy by suckering the child, we can't deal justly with her. To pretend that a pregnancy leaves a woman untouched does not prepare us to actually treat her well or see her as she is. 
I think that's often the temptation of you know, trying to minimize the claim of the baby. We can allow the baby to live because the baby is kind of trivial, doesn't, doesn't really pass anyone's you know, real experience with pregnancy or children in the first place. But it also implies that if the baby asked a great deal of this, or if your aging parent asked a great deal of you, or if your own illness caused you to ask a great deal of your friend, at some point that would become unbearable, immoral to ask so much. You should only ask so much of others that they can spare to give you and not so much that it hurts to give, or so much that they might require the succor of others in order to be able to care for you. And that's where I think we get to those two parallel lies that come out of that lie of autonomy, these fears of how can we exist when we are constantly failing this impossible standard. One is the one I've discussed, which is that if we acknowledge that women are not interchangeable with men, if women's particular form of vulnerability and dependence makes us non-identical, will we be forced to concede that women are not equal in dignity to men? And I think the second kind of frightening question out there for folks is if men and women are both marked by dependence, you know, are we able to acknowledge that without despising ourselves in a culture that fears dependence? If we grow to despise our own dependence, how will we know ourselves in relationship to God? I said women can fake autonomy less well and for less long than men. But no one, even someone born as an unusually hardy baby, a baby who receives an 11 on their APGAR scores for just being so gosh darn vital, um, someone who lives their whole life playing tennis up till age 90 and dropping dead suddenly of a heart attack having just returned their last point, which falls just inside the lines, even the man who kind of is a sparkling image of vitality on autonomy his whole life will, in that moment of death, be confronted by the dependence that has marked his whole life, his dependence on his savior, Jesus Christ. And the more our lives are kind of shielded from that fact, because we cannot abide ordinary interdependence among each other, the less prepared we are to reckon with who we truly are, adopted sons and daughters of God. I think one of the reasons that people find the experience of maternity and pregnancy kind of the most frightening and vivid example of dependence is, first of all, it can come to us unlooked for and unasked for. And because so many of the gifts that we give a child, we cannot ultimately choose whether or not to give in the moment, both in the sense of you know, that moment that parents have which feel like, I'd rather do anything than get out of bed and see if they've thrown up again. And yet you are getting out of bed even as you have the thought. Um, but also a different kind of unchosenness I think is very well highlighted by Natalie Carnes in her book, Motherhood, A Confession, which appropriately enough is a book modeled on the structure of Augustine's confession, but written around her relationship both with God and with her daughter. And she writes early on in the book, the body's sacrifices may be small and ordinary, but they can nevertheless be costly. I keep thinking about calcium. I think about my grandmother and her multiple falls, which turned into multiple breaks because she suffered from osteoporosis late in life, precipitated by having born and birthed four children. I think of my mother who herself bore three children, watching her mother's decline and taking up weight-bearing exercises and calcium chews. We do not choose to send calcium from our bones or to make these other sacrifices of care. Our bodies simply do these things, caring for the vulnerable one within, as if charity were the grain of the universe, as if we were already a charitable people. And I think in that way, both the experience of natality and pregnancy and motherhood is both kind of sublime and frightening and intimidating because it involves not just being asked for a great deal, but knowing it means saying yes to that need even before you think of it. That I don't decide moment to moment, well, that's enough calcium for now. You know, I think, I think you've gone about far enough, you know, and now I'm going to hold this back and now I'm choosing to give. That is this experience of just having 
not only our surplus but ourselves flow into the need of the person around us. And that this is the model for Christian charity, that we're called to give to those around us, not just those connected to us as well as related to us by blood, but the needy ones in our midst, as though we were already a charitable people. I think we see in it a model of what it means to say, I must decrease so he can increase, to expect that we are stewards not only of our wealth or of our possessions, but of ourselves given to us by God, and expecting to spend ourselves, sometimes, you know, imprudently in the eyes of the world, taking bigger risks than someone who relied only on their strength would take, because we want to do hard things with God's help. I think the other thing that really marks this is because those requests that a baby makes are both, you know, undeniable and can be unwanted, even though that places a heavy or distinct burden on women, it also offers us a distinct freedom, which is my boss can't say that's too much calcium. You've got to cut back. I need you to prioritize work. They can say a lot of other things that almost cash out as the same thing. But because women cannot endure some of the lies of autonomy, we automatically have to offer more friction, more resistance to demands we simply cannot meet, even when we're making a real effort to pretend to be autonomous. I think the way this burden manifests differently for men is men's strength is just as needed for a family, for a community, but because it's a little more attenuated, because it doesn't have the force of blood, because it involves a choice, it is easier for men to choose not to give of themselves, to not lay down their lives for others, and not just to make that choice individually, but to look around and notice that they live in a society that presumes they won't make that choice. A woman might be accommodated to a point and with resentment because technically she can't do any better. You know, I can't. I can't and I won't stop being pregnant, so everyone has to, to a certain extent, accommodate themselves to me. But a man's bonds of fatherhood are easier for a boss or a family member or someone else to ask him to ignore because they are less visceral. It's easier for a man to be formed by a culture that presumes his contributions are extra or optional, however much he longs to give them, and that he's expected in a different way to grow up into an autonomous person who doesn't mind having less asked of him or doesn't mind having his main contribution be his paycheck rather than his presence. And so I think women offer a different kind of resistance and have a different level of being forced to offer resistance to a culture that expects autonomy of us. But I don't think it's possible for that lie to hurt men so much less than it hurts women. I think the form that that pain takes is more foregone opportunities and a greater countercultural lift to say, I do want to extend myself over others. I do want to give urgently of myself. I do want to give to the point where it interrupts or disrupts other parts of my professional or personal life. And I see that people don't expect me to even desire to make that choice. Unfortunately, a culture that distrusts dependence or even is disgusted of it is a culture that ultimately will have no room for children. A culture that will not have space for the elderly, the disabled, the sick. A culture that fears the dependence of children will ultimately hate women because women are a constant reminder that others do depend on us, that we start our lives in dependence and we don't grow out of it entirely that as adults we are still marked by the needs others place on us and the trust others place in us. We face the temptation and we see a variety of ways in the culture around us that people either want to hide or destroy the dependent, to ask people to minimize their need, to make it invisible, to try and solve it as much as possible through the exchange or purchase of help, but not through asking friends or family because that would be too much to look for ways out in a culture that doesn't have room to say, I've passed the point in my life where I'm going to be able to reciprocate the care you give me. 
You know, the most commonly cited reason for opting for euthanasia in the United States, states that practice it, is not pain as people approach death. It's the fear of being a burden to others. In one person's essay, they said even just that it's not enough that she be not a burden. She doesn't even want to fear she might be. So she would want to pick death before she had reached the point of needing too much. So she could be confident she had cleanly exited before she had ever inconvenienced her family. And I think that attitude can't come out of anything except a catechesis in disgust with dependency, disgust with weakness, and a false confidence that we can avoid being an inconvenience to our family until the very end. Because I'm, I'm very confident that for that essayist, she had already inconvenienced her family at some point in her life, not just as a baby, but even past that point, that there were moments when her existence was hard for her family to bear up under, not because she was an exceptionally difficult person, but simply because that's what it means to live in relationship to others. But we keep treating those as brief moments of exception, rather than as our frailty and our need being core to who we are as human beings. And in fact, the grist that makes us live in relationship to others, that causes us to have friends rather than service providers. There's a quote I really love from St. John Henry Newman in his sermon titled Remembrance of Past Mercies, where he really gets at the core of what we lose when we lose our sense of being ultimately dependent. It's not just that we lose our trust in each other, that we might want to be with each other in times of need, not be repulsed by our need. It's not just that we lose our bearings and kind of write off large parts of our past as brief interruptions of our essential humanity that will hopefully continue uninterrupted towards our death, but we lose our core sense of who we are in relationship to God. He points out in his sermon that we are triply dependent on God. We cannot be our own masters. We are God's property by creation, by redemption, by regeneration. He has a triple claim upon us. Is it not our happiness thus to view the matter? Is it any happiness or any comfort to consider that we are our own? It may be thought so by the young and prosperous, but as time goes on, they, as all men, will find that independence was not made for man, that it is an unnatural state, that it may do for a while, but will not carry us safely to the end. No, we are creatures. And as being such, we have two duties, to be resigned and to be thankful. But in a world that won't acknowledge that fact of us as creatures, in a world that the more we're reminded of our creatureliness and our bodiliness and our frailty, the more we feel like we're losing our purchase on humanity, we're offered two rival duties. Where Newman saw our duties in relation to our dependents, be resigned, to be kind of truthful in the face of this, and to be thankful, our world offers us two rival duties, to obscure our dependence and to resent it. That a great part of our lives is marked by thinking about what we can do to hide our neediness, to only present the most manageable parts, to only ask our friends for the smallest part of what we need for them, and to carefully outsource the rest either, again, to paid help from strangers or to trying to manage on our own and making sure what we ask is moderate because do we trust our friends to stay our friends if we ask something that really demanded a lot of them? And to resent our dependence because even as we hide it from others, it's hard to hide from ourselves. And to think of these, again, as interruptions to our real life. It's something I've been guilty of myself. I was laid up for a while in the fall after getting a serious infection and just kept thinking like, well, when my life starts up again. But of course, I was alive the whole time. Um, and it was still hard, even writing on this topic all the time, to not think of this as a pause in my active, interesting life uh, that would start up again once my illness had passed versus this is my real life right now. This sickness is part of my real life. I expect to return to physical frailty relatively soon. Um, and that will also be my real life. 
And I can't discount any part of that as part of my life, because even in my most hale and hearty moments, I am more dependent on God than I was dependent when I had trouble walking on my leg on the various moms and families in our neighborhood who drove my kids to school, brought us meals, etc. That felt like the exceptional time when everyone else was rushing inward to my aid. But at every moment, simply by being conserved in physical existence by God, I am much more completely dependent than I was when laid up with a staph infection. But for so much of our lives, we live as though our dependency were Adam and Eve's nakedness in the garden, who had the idea, we will hide from God, and he won't notice what we've done or find out about it. Which, you know, I've taught catechesis to young kids, and they always find this kind of funny or surprising or perplexing. You know, don't they know God can see them? Like, you know, a very bright kid might ask, like, can't God see under the fig leaf anyway? Are we always naked in front of God? Yes, right, um, to some extent. But it's the kind of thing that children and even adults, for an extent, find funny when it's about someone else. And then when we look, we see we're constantly trying to hide things from God as though, you know, he won't find out or we can pick a more auspicious time to tell him. Uh, and it's nonsense. One way or the other, he always knows and sees us as we are. And the only person we're limiting here is ourselves and our ability to stand in front of him grateful and resigned and honest about who we are. I always want to think about what can I do in the near term in a kind of countercultural way to push back against this lie of autonomy. Because I don't think it's enough just to talk about it, and I don't think the easiest way to spark that conversation is to walk up to a friend and go, have you ever considered our culture is founded on the lie of autonomy? And I think the most important thing is making need visible and making it clear that you're unashamed of it, or even partly ashamed but overcoming it. I think the easiest way to have friends who will disclose their need to you, their real need, their deep needs, the needs they're not sure if you can meet, is to disclose your need to them. So the challenge I would offer people attending the lecture tonight is to think of something you need and ask a friend for it without offering to pay them back at the same time. Think of something you might go purchase in the marketplace, you know, using money to kind of make things even and square uh, so that you aren't someone who's needy, you're someone who's purchasing, and ask someone for it openly and nakedly instead, simply because you would like their help. Whether that's asking a friend to help free hang a door instead of paying a handyman, whether that's having a difficult time while people in the house are sick or just exhausted and asking someone to bring you food rather than ordering from a restaurant. Make sure your friends know that you're, you expect that your neediness does not discuss them. And then it's easier for them to trust in their moments of need, which already exist, that their neediness might not disgust you. There's an example I love um, from the book debt the first 5,000 years by anthropologist David Grabner, where a friend of his is an anthropologist is living among a group called the Tiv, and she's kind of screwing it up while she lives there, because people will do things for her out of kindness, and she understands that she's not supposed to just receive kindness and do nothing, but it turns out what she's doing wrong is she's paying people back too exactly. That when someone brings you a chicken, you should not next week bring them a chicken. You should bring them a number of eggs or some fruit or a basket. That's sort of the value of a chicken, but not exactly. Because paying back exactly, reciprocating carefully, implies we're quits now. You've done something for me. It was a burden on me to have this debt to you. I've paid it back, and now we're done. We're free again to part as strangers. I think a lot of our interactions are mediated that way, as though our goal is always to get back to equal. But what's normal, what's human, is to carry debt for a long time, even. Sometimes to have what usually happens among the TIV, which is you know, a modest amount of debt. You've brought me something, I've paid you back, but I've paid you back a little too much, and now later you'll come back and find me, and maybe you've paid me back, but a little under, but that's okay. Uh, and there's this idea that we have this continuing relationship and it will all work out in the end. 
A friendship is something that you can't walk away from, in part because there are those ties, not just of love, but of care that haven't balanced yet and with no urgency to balance because you expect your relationship to continue. And I think one of our tasks as Christians is you know, to proclaim the good news that Christ is Savior and to proclaim that it is good news to need one and to have one. And part of our countercultural witness has to be rebuking a horror of need and indebtedness. Because a culture that cannot abide being dependent on others that views that as something that pushes us out of the realm of being human, is a culture that cannot accept the one thing that divinizes our humanity. Christ's unpaybackable, no matter how many chickens you stack up, sacrifice on the cross to raise us from creatures to beloved sons and daughters. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Well, we have ample time for questions. Uh, for the sake of the uh, video, if we could speak them into the mic. So if you have a question, please feel free to shoot your hand up and I'll walk the mic to you. Thanks for sharing. That's, that's loud. Keep it at a distance. Um, so as you were speaking, I was thinking it's, it's, it's ironic that we have this allergic reaction to dependency and autonomy and yet, at the same time, this, this approach to parenting has stymied dependence and autonomy in kids so that their dependence is extending now like well into adulthood because of kind of like a helicopter parenting approach. So I'm just, in my mind, that's like a weird, like, do you, can you sort that out? Is, is, is there an explanation for why that is happening? Any, any reflections on that? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll point you a little bit towards, I just got to review two books I think engage interestingly with this question, and it's Jonathan Haidt's The Anxious Generation and Tim Carney's Family Unfriendly, and I got to review them both together for first things, and I'd point you there a little bit. But I think um, partly where you get that kind of anxious, smothering, nervous parenting is a real expectation that we can't handle risk. Um, you know, both Hate and Carney are interested in both the problem of phones and screens as a competitor to real play-based risky childhood. And to some extent, having children grow up, having them take chances means having non-adult supervised play, means having them make some real mistakes along the way, means more trips to the ER, right? And to some extent, if we think of our lives as mostly autonomous, mostly stable, each of those is not just scary on the real basis that it's scary, but it's a catastrophe. It means something has gone wrong. It means that when your kid breaks your arm, and I'm not rooting for any of your kids to break their arm, that like the normal life does not involve broken arms and now you've veered off of normal. But damage, injury, dependence, illness is all normal. That's part of the life I expect for my kids. You know, I expect them to be ill. I expect them to be injured. I want to minimize how dumb it is the way they get injured a little bit. But if you start with this kind of view of perfection, that I, what I want for my kids is untouchability, it's both not achievable, and you'll make yourself crazy as a parent trying to achieve it, and they won't get the chances to take moderate risks that teach them how to live in relation to the world. And that's the other distinction I'd make that was less a focus of my review essay, which is you know, we do want to see children grow to develop their capacities, but I don't want my children to grow into people who think of themselves as, I've now achieved autonomy. I've achieved mastery over the world. I control it. I want them to think of people who live in curious and exuberant relationship to the world. And I think often that idea of autonomy, of mastery, diminishes the reality of the world, or it makes the reality of the world a threat. That if I can't control the world, if it can surprise me, Again, in some sense, it can unperson me if my sense of my own personhood is founded in my control and my safety. I don't want that to be the kind of mastery my kids develop. I want them to develop a real curiosity about the world, even when that leads them to ask questions like, can I jump off this really big rock? Like, you can jump. Like, I can't guarantee how you'll land. Uh, but 
that they think of that as a question they're posing and don't resent the ground for not accommodating them. We've made no ER trips yet. I may sound a little less sanguine about this when we do. Thank you for your comments. It's very well received. Um, I do believe that we are, um, we, we have sort of a, a negative view of dependence, but it looks like technology has required um, people to sort of give over all their, um, you know, dependence on technology of all forms, including AI that's coming and things of that nature. So could you speak to, you know, why is there the disconnect between those two that we, we don't want dependence on people, but we don't mind giving dependence to machines. I think it's because we don't feel seen by them, right? It's not embarrassing. I think you know, one of the, the ways you see this turn up is if you're around people and someone uses a word you don't know, is your instinct to sneakily checking your phone what it means or go, I'll look that up later, just say to your friend, I don't know that reference, would you tell me? And it feels both more polite to not interrupt. My friend is speaking. I'll either find out later and catch up later. I'll check quietly under the table now, rather than to make your friend the instrument of you learning. Um, and I think often there's that sense that something could be solved almost in a tidier way or a less interrupty way or a way that asks less. Even that's such a small thing. If my friend's saying it, they must know what it is. They're telling me about it. They like it. Why don't I just ask? Um, but we think of that both exposure of our own ignorance as embarrassing and our interruption of the, like, the orderliness of the conversation is somehow rude. So we outsource the need to the computer. But of course, the computer doesn't have a continuing relationship with you. So what we lose is not just you know, the chance to practice humility by saying, I've never heard that word, I don't know who that is, um, which is good for us to practice, but the chance for our friend to enjoy share us something with us, and so that my knowledge of this word is always linked to which I learned from this friend, or, and when I asked, he told me about the first time he had encountered this word and why he likes it in contrast to the other word he could have used, um, and we cut ourselves off from that richness. Thank you for giving this speech, but uh, one of the questions I had was you kind of mentioned how like men had like more of a choice in like fatherhood, but especially with like the rise of like abortion and like uh, sort of these other abilities to like control uh, reproduction, wouldn't like women also have this ability to more and more choose like whether or not they engage with this sort of dependency? So men have an almost unrestricted freedom to walk away, you know, limited kind of only by how easily you can be tracked down for child support payments, which is not the same thing as a compelled experience of fatherhood. Men do have very little control over whether the mother of their child will decide to destroy their child. I think it's both a genuine burden some men bear, including the burden of living a more promiscuous life and then coming to realize later, you don't know if you've lost any children. You didn't have a relationship with the women you were intimate with that would cause you to know if there's a child out there that you don't know that you lost. I think it's a different burden for men than for women. It's something a few men have talked about publicly, but not very often, including because it's usually framed as men don't want to get caught by a child, as though men would never mourn a child, which really sells men short. So I wanted to ask a question about sort of the flip side to a lot of what you're talking about, which is responding to somebody else's need. Um, so I think a lot of times one of the things that in, in, in my life makes sharing your own need harder is that when somebody shares their need with you, you're not necess necessarily sure how to respond in a way that honors that need, that meets it to the extent that you can, but then points them toward the thing that would actually meet the need when they don't. And that's just really complicated. So sometimes we just say, well, let's just not share needs. So could you speak a little bit to, to that side of it? Yeah, I think some of the hardest needs to share are ones that are obviously can't be met by one person. And so it feels like first you have a duty to keep them private because 
all you can do is make people feel guilty with the enormity of it and that they can't meet it, right? Um, it's something that people who struggle with chronic illness for a long time have as a different and heavier burden where, you know, I had a staph infection, my whole leg swelled up, I couldn't bike my kids to school. Everyone knew I would get better. Everyone was up to give us meals for a week and do driving for a week. And that's a different experience than I now have a chronic illness and I'm never going to be able to drive my kids to school again. You know, I'd like to ask for your help. And you go, well, which kind of help are you asking me for, Leah? Are you asking me to drive your kids to school this week? Are you asking me to promise I'm going to do it forever? You know, I can't promise the second thing. Um, I think that's where it's important to be honest about what we can give now, what we might have to reevaluate in the future, and that we welcome being asked and that sometimes we'll say no. Um, because I think sometimes it's actually a reassuring thing to say, like, I'd rather you ask me, and there are some things I might be able to do for you that you don't expect I can do for you, or I have a good idea of how we could approach it. And when I can't, I'll say no, you know, but I'd rather you ask me and that sometimes I say no than that you not ask for fear I might need to say no or that I won't know how to say no to what I can't give. I think it's important kind of as Christians to say, I don't always know the limits of what I can give. So sometimes I might say, well, I don't know if I can do this for you. Would it be helpful for me to try for a week? And I might find out I really can't do this. You know? Or I might find out that I'm going to pair trying to do this for you with prayer, and it turns out I can do this. Or in that week where I stepped into the gap, someone else who was much better suited to do this stepped up, and it turned out I just had to do the week, and that was God's mercy to me, right? Um, but that we should think of ourselves as Christians as both welcoming the ask, including because we always have the opportunity to pray, but we only have that opportunity if people ask, of encouraging people to share need even if we can't meet it, and of sometimes extending ourselves a little imprudently, that our lives should look foolish to the rest of the world, at least some of the time, because we genuinely are banking on a kind of support that doesn't make sense without God. I wasn't trying to just see how far I could make you walk. I just... <laughs> So that, that was uh, a wonderful talk and very uh, charitable and compassionate, so I almost hesitate to ask this somewhat cynical question. But it seems that as uh, our increasing sort of um, radical independence has grown, it has certainly corroded our little platoons, our churches, our villages, our families. But the needs that those little platoons were meeting didn't go away. So is it the case that there are other um, entities who are benefiting from the redirection of those needs? Mostly not. So this is something where I think, you know, to the extent there are villains in this story, mostly they're not, ah, I, the sneaky caregiving industry, have found a way to erode interpersonal ties so that I can extract fees from people in exchange for meeting these needs. And that's largely because the needs are so great, it's very hard to meet them profitably. You know, it's interesting, there's been kind of a series of articles on long-term care insurance, uh, which has just turned out to be a terrible product on every side. You know, that's, that's what I'm trying to have the goal of. This is a need that used to be met within the family, People still have the need, the capacity to meet it isn't there. I'll set up a business that can meet this need and I'll charge people premiums and meet their need when they're old. And everyone is losing in this equation. You know, the elderly find that even though they've paid a lot in, their costs are so great that their insurance doesn't cover it to the extent they need to and you kind of can't just spend down your maximum premium in assisted living and then leave. You're there because you can't leave and you're stuck. But the insurers aren't getting rich either. They mispriced the product uh, because they didn't have enough experience when they started launching it with how long people would live and the extent of the care they would need. So this product that people have paid into that doesn't cover their full need, that the insurer is also losing money on and is no longer offering to new enrollees. So I think it's just that actually, we've really underestimated how much need was met by you know, what you can think of as the slack in people's lives, partly in that when you have you know, more of an expectation that people don't have to work all the way up to or past or chasing a rising retirement age, that people have a larger portion 
of the end of their working life to give to their communities and the people around them. That when it's more possible for families to be single income families for stretches of time, even if not permanently, then the stay at home parent not only has more to give their kid, but a lot more capacity to say, oh yeah, and today I'm bringing my kids over, or I'm having the other people's kids come over because that mom is injured, that mom is sick, so we're stepping into this gap, we're cleaning up this park. And all those things turn out to be very hard to price and buy individually in the marketplace, or even to buy the capacity and attention to the particular surroundings that come from it being from a neighborhood rather than from a vendor. So for the most part, I think we're unfortunately in a position where we see that safety net fall away and no market substitute for it. So no one's getting rich off of need in this way. These people are getting rich in other ways and some of them scammy ways, but no one's actually easily meeting the need as a product because the need is yawning and vast and genuinely comes out of charity and love. People who need can't buy what they need at the price that it would cost to provide it to a stranger. I mean, I think you see that also at the level of care for very young children, where the parents can't afford to pay for the care, and the people who are offering the care can't afford rent, right? And you go, how can, how can it cost me so much and profit them so little? And it's because the need is yawning and enormous. Um, the interesting economic thing here is New York City started rolling out the free 4K, which is that free care for four-year-olds and the goal being going down to free care for three-year-olds, and that was a state-subsidized program that was offered independently of infant care. And what they noticed when they started doing this that they hadn't really thought through is suddenly all the places that were doing infant care started to close because they'd relied sneakily in the way they structured costs on charging three- and four-year-olds more than the cost of care so they could charge the parents who were bringing infants less than the cost of care because there was no sustainable way to charge parents what it costs to have an adult watch four infants all day that parents could pay. They needed the bigger classrooms of three and four year olds and then to charge them what felt like more of a flat rate across all the ages, to be able to sneakily subsidize the cost of infant care because secretly almost no one could afford infant care. It just, it was something people could do for their child, but it was not something you could afford to pay someone to do. I think we kind of assume, well, because I am capable of doing this. Am I capable of earning enough to pay someone to do it? And the answer is often no. Your work was secretly very valuable and expensive, and replacing it in the market is very, very, very difficult, and usually relies on a secret subsidy somewhere. Um, I must say thank you for giving us the speech. Uh, one thing that I was wondering is in the modern family and families throughout time, uh, the relationship between child and mother have, has been a lot more like that is sort of the expression of dependence and infant relies on its mother to for like almost everything when it comes to infancy. And yet with fathers, it's sort of infants rely, I guess, on the act of insemination. And from then on, there's nothing physical. There's no physical dependence in that relationship, which I guess for mothers and children, I think that physical dependence sort of in one way keeps them in that relationship. It, it sort of forces this thing. And yet with men, since there's no physical depend dependency after that, it, I, I don't know, it, it doesn't, I guess, keep where them Where does the as connection bound. come from? Is right, that, yeah. where, where, that just, I guess I, I, I feel like that gives fathers an innate disadvantage and our culture is only encouraging that with um you know encouraging independence so that is that just doesn't seem fair i guess where like is there any way to find a solution to that i'm really glad you asked that because i think 
you know, it's very hard to be prepared to get married if you don't have a strong sense of what is marriage going to ask of me? And you know, I think we have a culture that can make it easy for men to hear, I'm kind of extra in a marriage. Like I needed to have a baby, sort of, like you were saying. But you know, in a culture where we think a lot of the incredible sacrifice of mothers, but don't kind of know what the men are doing or see more women who might out-earn their husbands, you know, so it's not the money. And again, I don't think anyone really wants their money to be the main thing they bring to their family. What is it the men are doing? So I'd like to tell you what my husband has done for me. So you have a very clear and concrete idea of that. Because I think, you know, again, it's, it's harder to be motivator of a sense of what you're aiming at without the experience of seeing it both in your own home and in a variety of others. So you're not stuck with only one image of what a marriage looks like, even if it's a good one. So when I had my first baby, uh, it was a surprise C-section, which is, you know, not one of the best ways to have a baby, except insofar as it meant she survived. But this meant that I could not use my middle for anything. Um, and I think it's, you discover very quickly how much you use your core muscles, which my gym teacher had always said, but I had ignored because I wasn't an athlete for everything. And so not only did I just not get out of bed for two or three weeks at night after my baby was born. Every time my baby woke up, my husband got up, he picked her up, he changed her, he brought her over to me, I nursed her, I started to fall back asleep, and that was fine, because he stayed awake and pinched himself if he had to, so I wouldn't fall asleep holding her. Then he took her away, changed her again, because she'd done another poo, and then put her back in her swaddle and put her down, and then two hours later, he did it again for two or three weeks. But that wasn't enough because I also couldn't move very easily or get out of bed. So while we were in the hospital, we paid attention to the way I used the hospital bed rails. I needed to use my arms kind of in a pull up to get out rather than my belly in a crunch. As we paid attention, we practiced so that Alexi could be the pull up bar so I could get out of bed, relying wholly on his strength to lever myself up rather than crunch and use the muscles I couldn't pull on yet. And he's had those experiences of stepping into that physical gap, not because the baby needs him as directly, but because I do. And because, like Sneed said, my baby's neediness made me more needy, both incredibly acutely and obviously through the C-section delivery. And then I had a different exciting complication for my second child. And I'm really rooting that this one will be an uncomplicated delivery. And if it is, I'll still stay in bed for two to three weeks and not do anything else at night because I'll still be healing. And throughout all of this, you know, the way we see our marriage is that there are some parts of our marriage that stay more fixed. I do the taxes, he usually takes out the trash, because that complements our particular attentivenesses to what we like taking care of in the house where we mind less. And that there are moments, particularly because I'm a woman, we all sink more heavily into need or frailty, and he'll find that he fills in that gap in unexpected ways. I think that's what a man offers across a marriage. Now, there are certainly times when Alexi is sick or needs more from me. His students are doing the winter's tale in a month, and he's going to need a lot from me over this month while he is increasingly at school doing rehearsals. But my dips into grave dependence come a lot more often, and his sense of what's asked of him changes each time. I think there's more of a readiness that's asked of men to do anything, fill any gap, step into it proactively instead of waiting to be asked, and to see what your wife's dependence will ask of you. And I think it's through having a baby like that we had a lot more of the experience of for richer, for poorer, for sickness or health promises we made, but didn't live as intensely until things got harder. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, when it comes to reading fiction or poetry, are there any certain authors or texts that you find have characters that demonstrate this well? Do you have a favorite? Just curious. All right, so a few that come to mind here. Um, you know, some of which are nonfiction, I'll say. There's just um, a few beautiful books that are often memoirs of a parent who loses a child in both cases or has a child with a severe health challenge. Um, it's perfectly human of a mom who had a baby who received a 
life-limiting diagnosis in utero and had to decide how to spend the time she had with her baby. Um, and the other book is Raising a Rare Girl of a Mom Whose Baby Had a Congenital uh, Difficulty. And Anne was figuring out what does it mean to love this baby, not to miss the baby she would have been, and not to see her as less than here. Um, those I really like on the nonfiction side. One more memoir that's not quite the same thing is just uh, Sheldon Van Hawkins' A Severe Mercy, which is about him and his wife who met as, and they say it as pagans, right? As like vibrant, wild, strange people who said, we want to spend our whole lives together. We don't want to drift into decrepitude in our old age. So when we're old, we'll buy a plane and we'll just crash it into a mountain so that we are extinguished in the same instance in our full vitality. And in between them making that plan and the rest of their lives, they became Christians. Um, but Sheldon, and he says this in the first chapter, so it's okay that I'm telling you it here, loses his wife not that long after they convert. And a lot of what they had planned for in their life was planned around the idea of control, of they would build something together that they would maintain mastery over in their relationship. Um, and his grappling with her loss and what that means for his faith is very beautiful as a book. In the realm of fiction, I think one of the best books about what it means, and this will also go for your question in some ways, to be married for a long time and live through ups and downs and different demands and periods of greater holiness and periods of falling back is Kristen Lovren's daughter. So, got 800 pages of Nobel-winning Swedish fiction, uh, but it's very good. And the reason it's very good and the reason it has to be 800 pages is because you can write a short story about a decisive moment in someone's life, but to give a sense of the ebbs and flows of moving towards God and away from God in small moments that don't feel remarkable in the moment, you need 800 pages. You need the canvas of a whole life to show what Sigrid Unset shows about Kristen. We have time for maybe two more questions. Uh, in, in, some, in some of the... Am I on? Okay, yeah. In some of the questions, uh, we were hearing this interesting uh, problem, concern, of we want people to become mature with uh, a sense of responsibility and resourcefulness without somehow miscoding that as autonomy. And uh, I just, it throws me back on a great microeconomics professor I had many years ago now, uh, who liked to bring us around to the uh, line in one of Paul's epistles where he says, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor with his hands at something good so that he may have to give to him who needeth. And is there something there that helps us try to define that balance? It still feels a little vague as I say it, but I know, you know, you're a policy analyst, so you can probably help me with that. <laughs> well, I actually think when it comes to that question of charity and reciprocation and what should we do with our excess wealth, um, how are we helping, um, I actually really like, and I get mixed up about whether this is St. Augustine or St. Ambrose, um, but it's, I cited it in a piece in comments, so you can check where I had the citation correct later, um, which is that we often talk about, like, well, what will we give to the poor? What from our position of strength? Can we give them what's our responsibility to amass stuff and then steward it well? Um, and the church father here um, who is talking about almsgiving goes like, wow, you know, the rich are so lucky that they have the poor out there to save their lives because their riches are dragging them down to hell. And but for the visible arresting need of the poor, they might complacently sail on. And it's the gift of the poor in making their needs manifest and loud and undeniable that has the power to jar us out of this complacency and avoid hell. So he doesn't see this as, well, here are the rich who are powerful, who then out of their surplus give to the poor. And even though the poor genuinely need the money and genuinely need the food, he's like, well, the people who are drowning this story are the rich. And they're being pulled out of the pit by this, you know, this tie of neediness. Um, and that the poor are generous in saving them from hell. You see, it's like the poor could just die. You know, they could just go off and die, and then they would die, but the rich would go to hell. 
I don't say that to Congress people all the time, but maybe it would help if I did. <laughs> um, you've already given advice, which I will be thinking on, but I, want, I wanted to ask for maybe a little bit more specific, if you had more specific advice about um, just this particular situation that I find myself in, which as a mother um, and who has friends who are mothers who also have young children, um, that I find myself often when I have a need thinking, well, all of my friends have the same needs. Um, and so how could I ask them to help? But then also, I, I mean, I've, it feels like a broken record because my needs are always, oh, I'll have this need again in two weeks. So do I ask help now? Do I wait till it's worse? Like, oh, and also I just get tired of sounding like a broken record. Um, and so end up being silent for both of those two reasons. And so I was just wondering if you have specific advice for that situation of evaluating how can we start to make our needs visible and also to help one another well. I have kind of a, a long-term structural piece of advice that may not be immediately helpful and a short-term piece. I think what you're describing with the sense of, but we're all having the same need at the same time and now we can't help each other is one of the reasons why it's really good to have mixed age and stage of life communities and friendships. Um, and that's not just so married couples can ask all their single friends to do infinite babysitting for them, though it's a plus, right? Like, um, it's also because as someone who's been both married with kids and single without them, people miss kids, right? And it's actually easy to wind up shut out from the world of children while wanting to be married and feeling like you have no control over whether that will happen. And sometimes what's feels very burdensome to you as a mother and feels like, how can I ask someone to just come over and watch my kids while I take a nap? It's something that I've at various times in my life been thrilled to do because I don't have any kids and it's, you know, I can't just ask people or maybe I can to be like, I miss kids. Can I come have your kids for a bit? Um, I think it's particularly hard for young men, again, who we kind of presume are uninterested in children, even at the age when they might be getting ready to be married. But it feels less natural to say, let me ask this nice young single man if he wants to watch my kids. It feels riskier, but where you have a deep friendship, it's worth doing because it's actually a lot harder for young men to foster their love of children and develop themselves as potential fathers than it is for young women. But an age-mixed community really helps with that. I also think it can be good for a parish to keep a list and make those connections of people who want to give more, who feel at loose ends or disconnected from the community and people who are drowning, and for that to be the foundation for a friendship. But the short-term advice I have is, it's good to ask anyway. Um, and it's good to ask sometimes without the excuse. It was much easier for me to ask for help when I was sick, because I can say, I was in the ER on Tuesday. I need people to drive my kids to school. And everyone goes like, that's a legitimate need. A doctor said that something was wrong with you, right? Like, uh, but I'm going to ask people for a different kind of help in the next couple of weeks. I'm planning, once I get home, to like email a couple of my friends and go like, Alexi has so much rehearsal and we're all very tired. I was wondering if you would invite us to your house for dinner so we don't have to make dinner. Um, and, you know, that has some level of excuse, but I'm much more culpable for it. And it's obvious. It's not... I am sick through no fault of my own, and it's a real illness, and it has a name. I'm saying, we're really tired. Can we come to your house? And I expect some of my friends are going to say yes, and some of them might say, like, oh, we'd love to, but everyone in our house has stomach flu, you know, or any of the other things that are parallel crises that inhibit our ability to care for each other. But I think it's good to have the habit of sometimes asking without a good excuse. Um, again, so it's clear that you do want to rely on friends. You do want a friend to say to you, I'm really tired, like not for an official reason or a good reason, but simply because my life is tiring. Can I ask something of you without a doctor's note, right?
I just have two points of order before we dismiss. The first is that we have some time before we have to be out of this space, and there is a book table with some of Leah's books on it in the other room. So if you have the time to look over the book table, talk to Leah, hang out and continue the conversation here, please do so. The second thing is that, like all good conversations, this one is beginning, not ending, in this particular moment. Uh, so the challenge of the Lyceum Project to you, until we meet again, is to continue this conversation and try to figure out how to change the way you live as a consequence of what you've heard and the truth that's there. So that's the challenge of the Lyceum Project to you all this evening as you begin this conversation and continue it now and then over the, over the course of the next year. So thank you all again for spending your Friday night here. Um, we're grateful to Leah for coming. We're grateful to Eric up there in the box of power working the sound and the video. Um, and I hope that you've all been blessed by what you've heard and are blessed by this continuing conversation going forth. Thank you again.